This is the extended version of the discussion about the temporal bone. We need an extended version because this is a very complex bone. It definitely would not be classified as a flat bone like, for example, the parietal bone can be. It is an irregular bone. It's an irregular bone because it's very difficult to describe. It has a very complex shape. The complexity of the bone relates to the fact that it is doing quite a few things. It is not only contributing to the wall of the cranium, the lateral and inferior walls of the cranium, but it is also going to be the place where you're going to find the only movable articulations in the skull. With the mandible, it's going to give you the temporomandibular joint, and the only other place where you have movable articulations in the skull are going to be found within the middle ear cavity associated with the tiny ear ossicles. It is going to be associated with your special sense of hearing and equilibrium. And clinically, it's going to be very important because upper respiratory infections in young children can lead to an infection of a part of this bone called the mastoid process, giving you mastoiditis, which then can lead to more serious complications when the infection gets into the cranium and causes a meningitis and then possibly an encephalitis. So in this video, we're going to go through the bone in greater detail, but even so, we're only going to scratch the surface literally of the complexity of this bone because its interior is going to house your sense of hearing and equilibrium, and that's a whole other video. As in the shorter version of this video, we divide the bone into three parts. We have the squamous part, we have the tympanic part, and here we're going to have, instead of the petrous part, we're going to have the petromestoid part. The reason for dividing the, the petrous part into the petromestoid part will become clearer in a bit. To further talk about these three parts, I'd like to turn to a figure from Gray's Anatomy. Of, and so here we have our skull, and you can see the temporal bone highlighted. And when we take a closer look at it, again we can see the three major parts from this lateral view. If you look at how these three parts develop, this figure will illustrate this at infancy. So uh, this bone develops from ossification centers. It's a very complicated bone. It develops from eight different ossification centers. And you can see at infancy we can see three parts of the bone in this figure. The pinkish part is again going to be our squamous part. The yellow part is the tympanic part, which is going to further develop, fully mature into the external auditory canal. Then the blue part is going to give us our petromestoid part of the bone. So here we have the bone at maturity, again using a Gray's Anatomy figure. And we're going to look at first the squamous portion. And again, it's called the squamous portion because it is flat like a scale, a squama. And it is going to have the zygomatic process. Now, why is it called the zygomatic process? Here, again, is the fully articulated skull. And here, again, is our zygomatic process. The zygomatic process is going to articulate anteriorly with the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. And the, together, they're going to form the zygomatic arch. The word zygomatic implies a yoking together of two things. You might be familiar with the word zygote, which refers to the conceptus, the union of the male and the female sex cells. The word zygote implies a yoking together of two things. And here we are again yoking together these two bones to form a zygomatic arch, and that's the reason it's called the zygomatic arch. It's formed from the joining of these two bones. So now if we go back to the individual bone and look more closely at the zygomatic process, we'll see that there's more to the zygomatic process 
than just simply forming your zygomatic arch, which is going to give you your cheekbone. Inferiorly, on the zygomatic process, we have a depression, a fossa, which is referred to as the mandibular fossa, also known as the glenoid fossa. And this fossa is going to form the movable articulation with the condylar process of the mandible. And this is going to give you your temporal mandibular joint. So if you discount the movable joints associated with the ear ossicles, again, this is the only movable joint you're going to find in the skull. Directly in front of the mandibular fossa, anterior to it, there is an, a swelling, an enlargement of the bone that is referred to as the articular tubercle. The term tubercle refers to this enlargement in the bone, this bump, and it's called the articular tubercle because it is associated with this movable articulation. Posterior and inferior to this articulation, we find the tympanic part. The tympanic part is called the tympanic part because it is going to, at maturity, form the wall, the bony wall of the external acoustic meatus, which can also be referred to as the external auditory canal. And of course, this is going to be associated with our sense of hearing. And this part will be looked at in greater detail again when we look at the special senses. Behind the tympanic part, we can see the mastoid portion of the petromastoid part of the bone. The mastoid por portion is going to have the mastoid process. Now, mastoid means like a breast. So we could assume that the anatomist looked at this process and it occurred to him that it looked like a breast. You see the, the stem of this word used in other clinical words like mastectomy, the removal of the breast, mastitis, which is an inflammation of the udders of a cow. Now, why the anatomist decided to call this the mastoid process, why it occurred to him that this looked like a breast, who knows? I can only imagine that these guys were kind of nerdy for their time and might have been a little bit lonely. It's only my speculation. The long slender process in front of the mastoid process is called the styloid process. This is an important process from the point of view of attachment because a number of important muscles are going to attach to it that are going to control the tongue, the larynx, the pharynx, and also there are going to be ligaments that attach the styloid process to the hyoid bone. So it's going to serve as an attachment for quite a few things. The word itself, styloid, implies its slender appearance. You can think of a stylus, for example, as being a long, linear, slender object. Styloid means like a stake or like a spine. Let's review what we just discussed by using this isolated bone from a plastic skull. Starting off with the squamous portion of the bone. Again, you can really appreciate the squamous part as being a flat part when you look at it from a different perspective. Here we can see it from a different perspective, and you can see that this part of the bone is indeed flat, like a scale. And extending from it, again, we're going to have the zygomatic process, and here we can get a view of the zygomatic process. And you can see how it extends first laterally, then anteriorly, to join with the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. And here again is a lateral view of the zygomatic process. And we can see again here the mandibular fossa, which is also known as the glenoid fossa. And right in front of it, we have the articular tubercle. Now I want to show you an inferior view using this articulated skull to give you a better understanding of what we're dealing with here with the mandibular fossa and the articular tubercle. So here from this perspective, you can see that this is indeed a rounded out depression, somewhat elliptical, uh, that gives you the mandibular fossa, also known as the glenoid fossa. The, the surface of this bone would be very smooth because 
in the living skull, it would be lined by smooth articular cartilage, hyaline cartilage. And here you get a better appreciation of the articular tubercle. It is a raised portion of the zygomatic process, and it's somewhat cylindrical in shape. So before we move on, let's review. Here is again the zygomatic process, the part that extends anteriorly and joins with the temporal process of the zygomatic bone to give you the zygomatic arch. Somewhat posterior and inferior to the mandibular fossa, we find the tympanic part, which is going to form the external acoustic meatus, also known as the external auditory canal. And over here, we have the mastoid portion of the petromastoid part of the temporal bone. And the mastoid portion is referred to as the mastoid portion because it bears the mastoid process. And then over here, this slender spine-like process is the styloid process. To get a better view of the petrous part of the petromastoid part of the temporal bone, we need to look at this view. This is a view of the interior of the skull. And the petrous part is going to be shaped somewhat like a pyramid, where the base of the pyramid is resting on the mastoid por portion, and the sides of the pyramid extend anteriorly and medially. And if you imagine this to be a long, slender pyramid, well, this is kind of what it looks like but it doesn't come to an apex, it comes to a blunt tip where we're going to find the opening of the carotid canal, which we'll come to a little bit later. So the pyramid is going to have three sides, and we're going to see two of the sides here. We have the anterior surface, that's one of the sides, and then we have the posterior surface. We're going to see the inferior surface when we look again at an inferior view of the skull. The angle between these two surfaces forms the petrous ridge. On the petrous ridge, you're, you're gonna find the location of the superior petrosal sinus. Underneath the anterior surface, we're going to find the carotid canal. Now you can't really see the carotid canal, which is going to be the canal through which the internal carotid artery travels on its way into the cranium, but Medially, you can see that the roof of the carotid canal is, is missing. It opens up, in other words. Right where it opens up, you'll find another opening, which is referred to as the foramen lacerum. It's called the foramen lacerum because it is basically just a jagged opening. Like a laceration is a, a jagged cut, for example. And the foramen lacerum is not going to be open in the living skull. It's going to be closed by soft tissue or hyaline cartilage. So it's only significant in that you see it when you look at the skull, and anatomists will name everything they see. On the posterior surface, we're going to find an opening which permits two cranial nerves to enter the bone, the facial nerve and the, and the vestibular cochlear nerve. And this opening is referred to as the internal acoustic meatus or the internal auditory canal. We'll get a better view of it in, in just a second. Right over here, we have the opening called the jugular foramen, which is going to be where the internal jugular vein originates. This opening is also going to allow for the passage of three important cranial nerves, the ninth, the tenth, and the 11th cranial nerves. The temporal bone doesn't completely form this foramen, but it does contribute to its formation by way of the, of the jugular fossa, which we'll look at a little bit later. So the jugular fossa of the temporal bone is going to join with the jugular notch of the occipital bone to give you the jugular foramen. So as promised, here is a better view of the posterior surface. Here is our petrous ridge. And right over here, 
we have again our internal acoustic meatus, also known as the internal auditory canal. We get a better view of the jugular foramen. It's a fairly large opening. And the jugular fossa, again, of the temporal bone is going to join with the occipital notch of the occipital bone to give you it. It's a fairly large opening. It's going to allow, again, three cranial nerves to exit from the skull. It's also going to be the place where the sigmoid sinus, which is draining blood from the brain, is going to become the internal jugular vein as the blood drains from the skull and then descends down the internal jugular vein. So I think we can agree that there's a lot of complicated things going on here, a lot of parts that may not be as easily seen in different skulls. So let's look at a Gray's Anatomy figure to review what we've looked at. So again, we're looking at the interior of the skull in this figure, and we can see here is the petrous ridge, which is the angle between the anterior and posterior parts of the petrous portion of the, of the bone. Before we move on, let me just point out that petrous means stone-like, and you can think of it being called petrous because it is a dense part of, of the temporal bone, and so it's dense like stone. I like to think of it as being called petrous because it kind of looks like a pebble or a rock, if you will. However you want to look at it, petrous means stone, and so this is the petrous ridge. Then you have this opening, which is really not significant, except you see it in, in the, the skull stripped of any soft tissue, called the foramen lacerum. Over here, this indicates where you find the carotid canal, and you can see again next to the foramen lacerum where the roof of the canal has opened, and you can see inside the canal. Right over here again, we have the internal acoustic meatus, which is also known as the internal auditory canal. And we see again the jugular foramen. Here again is an inferior view of the skull, an articulated skull. So now we can look at the inferior surface of our pyramid. But before we do that, let's again look at our mastoid process, which is part of the mastoid portion of the petromastoid part of the bone. Here, medial to the mastoid process, we can there is a notch or a groove, and this notch or groove is referred to as the mastoid notch, and it also is referred to as the digastric notch because it is the place where the digastric muscle will attach. Then again here you have our styloid process this long slender process which is hard to appreciate from this perspective. But between the mastoid process and the styloid process there is a foramen which is referred to as the stylomastoid foramen. It is an important foramen because it permits the passage of the seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve. Over here we can see the jugular fossa. We can't really appreciate it very well from this perspective, and we'll look at it again in a second. Anterior medial to the jugular fossa, here is the opening to the carotid canal, and the carotid canal travels anterior medially towards where we find our foramen lacerum. We'll finish this video using this plastic piece that came from a plastic skull. It is not the highest quality specimen, but it'll serve our purposes. So here again we have our mastoid process, and here is the mastoid notch, also known as the digastric notch. And here we can see again our styloid process. And between the mastoid process and the styloid process, we find the stylomastoid foramen. Now I'm using this because here you can see why it's called the jugular fossa. Here it is. And a fossa is a depression. It's kind of a scooped out depression that you find in the bone that's going to form the foramen, the jugular foramen 
with the jugular notch of the occipital bone. Here you see the opening to the carotid canal, and the carotid canal angles towards where you find the foramen lacerum. So I'll end this discussion here, and you can see there's a lot to talk about when we look at the temporal bone. There are details which I skipped over, which if you are, are a serious student of anatomy, you would want to explore on your own. In a future video, I'd like to show you the interior of the petrous portion of this bone to show you the marvelous detail of the hearing apparatus and the apparatus associated with equilibrium. The bony labyrinth, in other words, with its cochlea, its vestibule, and semicircular canals. It's quite fascinating. But I think we've spent enough time. And if you want to review, you can go to our, the quiz link below. This quiz I made a little bit longer because of all the extra detail. And finally, if you would like to view a shorter version of this video for exam purposes, for example, I provide a link to my short version of this same video uh, on the temporal bone. And here are image attributions. Uh, all, my, all the images I used are in the public domain, but I provide the attributions anyway here and down below in the description. And also, I would like to introduce you to my assistant, Apollo.